Buongiorno. Come va? Bene. So before I begin, I do want to make one acknowledgement and shout out to Mauro Rubin and uh, Federico Zoya from JoinPad, who were very kind to let me interview them. Uh, it's actually one of the largest augmented reality companies in Europe, and they're headquartered here in Milan. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. But to get started, I have a question. How many of you in the room have actually tried a virtual reality headset before? Okay, that's a fair number. I'll flip it. How many, of you, how many in the room have not tried a virtual reality? Okay, so actually a very a small number. So I can actually show you, if you've actually not tried a VR experience, this is for most people what your first experience can look like. Uh, smiles, happy butterflies, it's usually positive. Uh, in some rare cases, this is also possible. If you haven't tried a VR experience, though, I promise we won't let this happen to you. So, virtual reality is not a new technology. It's actually been around for quite a while. Uh, but thanks to this person, this is Palmer Lucky. He's on the cover of Wired Magazine. Uh, because of Palmer, we, for the very first time, are now living in a world of affordable consumer virtual reality. It's not, by any means, a mainstream technology. I imagine, actually, very few of us today have a virtual reality headset at home. But because of Palmer, for the first time, this technology is now affordable. So the story behind uh, Palmer's invention, so he invented the Oculus Rift. It's one of the most popular consumer VR headsets on the market today. So this was a photo taken uh, in 2012. So as a 19-year-old college student, Palmer was frustrated that the, the equipment that he had access to in his research lab at the University of Southern California wasn't also available to him at home. It was too expensive. And so this is a photo from his parents' garage, you know, a very cliche Silicon Valley example, where he invented this device that was affordable. And we just heard from Pascal all about crowdfunding. So in 2012, at the, the sort of the beginning of this new trend, instead of taking this idea to the venture community and trying to raise money for it, he puts it on Kickstarter and raised two and a half million dollars. This was, at the time, the world's most successful crowdfunding campaign that had ever been completed. So that's pretty impressive, right? A 19-year-old kid be able to do this. Except for the fact that 18 months later, he sold the entire company to Facebook for $2 billion. So this is the world that we, we live in. So we could argue whether or not this was the right amount of money for Facebook to pay, but to understand why this was such a big deal and why Facebook acquired this company, there's really just two things you need to know about consumer virtual reality today. So the first is it improved on the field of view. It's a fairly straightforward concept. It's what it sounds like. How big is the screen when it's on your face? The human vision is about 210 degrees. So the 110 degrees field of view that the Oculus Rift has was essentially enough to create this disappearance of the edge of the screen. You're entirely immersed in this world. Now the second piece is probably more important, which is what's called latency. Latency is the term used to describe how long does it take the computer to show your eyes the image of what you're supposed to see based on where your head is moving. And even just a millisecond of delay is enough to cause the nausea, the simulation sickness that, uh, that many people associate to these virtual reality experiences. So then the question with this is, why should we care? Okay, so now we have this affordable technology, but what's the big deal? So to address this question, I can share with you that I am not normally a comfortable public speaker. This is not a, this is not a, a skill that, that is one that, was, that came naturally to me. Uh, my background is in, in writing, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I actually have a photo of the very first time in my life that I was ever asked to give a public presentation. So this photo was taken about seven years ago at Singularity University. Uh, about five minutes before this photo was taken, I got an email from a colleague of mine. It said, hey Aaron, today we have a group of investors coming in from Mexico. It's really important that we impress them. We're trying to raise money. We may want to uh, seek funding from this group. By the way, I was supposed to give the presentation. My car broke down today, so here's my slide deck. Good luck. Don't screw this up. This did not go well. As far as I know, no one in this room has ever funded Singularity University, okay? 
So this was a traumatic experience for me. I had, you know, at one point I had to physically grab my leg to stop it from shaking, my voice was quivering. If any of you have had this experience, around the same time, I was thinking about, okay, what could I have done to have been more prepared for this experience? So around the same time, the first development kits for the Oculus Rift were just coming uh, on the scene. So I had the idea to, okay, well, what if I could build a simulation of a public speaking environment and I could practice the social pressure of being on stage in front of a room of people, and even just a very basic video game-like experience like this is enough to create the, the sensation of, of being on stage. So to come back to this question, what's the big deal with this technology? Essentially, any experience that you want to have access to, that's difficult to have access to, it's difficult to assemble a room of people to practice being on stage. You know, AC Milan has a, a Europa League game on Thursday that, you know, sitting on the sidelines is probably expensive, but in virtual reality, many more people might be able to have that experience of, of being close to the field. So this is why this technology is a big deal. Okay, so here are the, the three pieces that we'll cover in our time together. The first, really discuss you know, how this technology sits in the story of the history of interfaces, because ultimately, this is a technology that allows us to communicate with, with our computers in a new way. I will talk briefly about a very specific kind of augmented reality and how it changes our relationship to physical space. And then finally, how many in the room have either seen the film or read the book Ready Player One? Okay, so maybe, maybe about a third. So we're gonna cover a bit about the real life developments that are bringing that, that into the real world. And if you're not familiar with Ready Player One, that's okay, uh, we'll come back to that. Okay, the next interface. So to understand the history of computing, you really need to understand the history of computing interfaces, the way that we've talked to computers. Now, consider that working with computers about 70 years ago was an incredibly complex skill. The programming language, you know, 70 years ago involved physically rewiring a computer. We didn't have JavaScript or C++. It was an incredibly complex skill set, required a lot of training. And then along comes a new interface, still fairly difficult to use, but it at least saved you from having to uh, physically rewire the machine, the punch card system. Maybe the first real breakthrough was the invention of the command line, the first type that you could talk to a computer just by typing words on a, on a screen. What happens at each progression is that more people are able to use computers, and then the real mainstream moment, this was the moment that my parents were able to first use computers, the graphical user interface, when working with computers involved just clicking on pictures. Now ultimately what we're talking about is a new interface, and this is a really big deal, and in fact, it's so new, we don't really have a, a, you know, a uniform word or term. I'm using terms like augmented reality, virtual reality, Microsoft calls it mixed reality, Google calls it immersive computing, there's MR, XR, all of these terms. Just to briefly address a very common question, what's the difference between virtual and augmented reality? When you hear people refer to virtual reality, it's largely referring to an experience where you're fully immersed inside of a headset, as opposed to augmented reality, where you're still in your normal everyday surroundings, but you're enhancing that experience with either audio or visual information, just like with Google Glass. Now, what's really significant about all of these new interfaces, both augmented and virtual reality, is that they leverage the use of three-dimensional space. Now this is a very big deal. My colleague at Singularity University, Jody Medich, talks quite a bit about this idea that, that humans are, are naturally 3D thinking things. You know, as babies, we're born into this world and we, you know, we move our arms and we pick things up. It's only as adults where we're asked to learn these complicated skills of moving a mouse on a two-dimensional screen and typing on a, on a keyboard. Now, What's, uh, what's significant about this is that it enables, again, far more people to use computers. Now, maybe the best way to explain why this is a big deal is consider for a moment how many of our grandparents today play video games. Don't be fooled by this very crisp looking photo. I imagine that the people in this photo have never actually played a video game before. This is a stock uh, photo. But consider the complicated motor skills of, of pressing buttons on a gamepad. It's not an easy or intuitive uh, skill to develop. But consider for a moment the Nintendo Wii, a very different kind of video game that instead of pressing buttons on a gamepad, you actually just move your arms. 
Now, this, it turns out, is actually very popular with our grandparents. Grandparents love playing Nintendo Wii. There's endless photos online of, of people, our grandparents' age, playing Nintendo Wii. Now, this is what's coming to our computer interfaces. Many more people will be able to be involved in this interface. Okay, so why should we care? Why is that significant? Consider for a moment that in the case of cybersecurity, and we're gonna hear much more about uh, cybersecurity uh, later today, that in a few years will be short, it's like expected, almost two million uh, cybersecurity network analysts. Now one of the reasons for this is that to become a network analyst requires a very complicated set of skills. You have to navigate Python scripts, log files, understand forensic analysis, but what if instead of understanding these complex skills, which requires training and, and years of, of development, what if becoming a network analyst were just like playing a video game? So that's the idea behind this company based in the United States. So what you're seeing is a visual interface tool. So every building on this graphic represents a device on a company's IT infrastructure. So the shape of the building tells you what kind of device it is. Is it a mobile phone? Is it a server? Is it a piece of uh, connected equipment in a factory? The height of the building tells you how much bandwidth. The width tells you the net flow activity. If it changes a different color, maybe there's a threat associated. Then you can separate those buildings into different neighborhoods. So maybe you have a neighborhood for the executive team, or maybe you have a neighborhood just for all of your factories in Milan and all of your factories in, uh, in India. So what this means is that if you're a network analyst working for a company that uses this, you sit down inside of a virtual reality environment and you walk around your company's IT infrastructure almost like it's a real city and you're a police officer protecting the space. Now, I interviewed the CEO of this company and he pointed out that in the next five years, it'll be very common for companies with large IT infrastructures to have entire rooms of people that do all of their job inside these virtual environments. So today, if you go into an office building, it's very common to see you know, desktop computers and people sitting in front of their screens. Very soon, it's likely we'll see people also in augmented and virtual reality environments as well. And it's not just virtual reality where we're seeing this, this pace of development. How many of you have heard of a company called Magic Leap? Okay, so only just a few. Magic Leap is an incredibly fascinating <laughs> case study in, in the business landscape. Uh, the world has known about Magic Leap for about four years. They've raised uh, about two billion dollars. They create a pair of augmented reality glasses. Uh, and only in the last few months have we as a you know, community even seen what the augmented reality glasses uh, look like. They just released some of the first images. Uh, it turns out that they're designed to be worn on a first date, which is great, uh, very appropriate. But regardless, while wearing these glasses, you see these high resolution images. Uh, just to get one, one demonstration, this is a developer who lives in uh, Texas who I think this is one of the most uh, coolest examples I've seen. Imagine being able to go to a website, you see a pair of shoes that you want to try on, and you're able to, using augmented reality, pull those shoes right off the web page, basically throw them on the floor around you, and you can almost you know, try on these pair of shoes at home using augmented reality. So this is, this is of course coming. Uh, these are some of the first uh, examples. The, the, the headsets have only been made available to the developer community just in the last month or so. Uh, and of course, Magic Leap isn't the only company to develop these headsets. Uh, the Microsoft HoloLens is a very common one. But probably more important than understanding these devices that we wear on our head, in the immediate short term, it's far more likely that the most relevant and useful kind of augmented reality will actually be something that comes in your pocket on your phones. So this is maybe the biggest development that's happened in this entire space in the last few years. Apple released a toolkit called AR Kit, which transformed the landscape, allowing developers to build concepts. It actually forced Google to have to transition into, into following and doing uh, a similar concept. But just to get a sense of, of what you can build, this is Amazon. So using AR Kit, Amazon built a shopping tool that allows you at home to see what different objects that you might buy online, how they would look in your home. So if you've ever had the experience of, say, going to Ikea, buying a piece of furniture, only to discover that when you bring it home and put it in the space, you don't actually have enough room. Or I hear people say that they sometimes will buy a car and discover that it doesn't actually fit in their garage. It's actually incredible how common that is. 
So this is, this is an example of that three-dimensional interface. Using three-dimensional space as something that as humans is very useful and something we're very good at. Now, there's a whole range of industries and sectors that will be affected by this. I've selected one, education and training. One, because I think it's gonna be the most immediate uh, use case for the technology, but one that's also quite broadly relevant to, to most of us. Now, as an example of, of why this is a big deal, consider the way that most of us learn new skills. So this is a company in San Francisco, it's called Tribe, and they're going after the YouTube tutorial business. So if you want to learn a new skill, say, you know, simple things like how to tie a bow tie or how to set up a Wi-Fi router, or how to, you know, dance tango, most people will go to YouTube and watch a video, someone explaining how to do this. But with virtual reality, because we can use our hands, we can now just learn those skills by actually doing them ourselves. And that is a very big deal. So I went to this uh, company and they, they showed me an example of a demo of a DJ control box, which I've never used the DJ controller in my life. I don't know how this works. But being able to actually use the equipment and learn how to do it in virtual reality is a far more immersive and effective way to learn a new skill. You know, I've always wondered what these knobs and dials do. The most incredible thing about this experience was when I took off the headset, they put me in front of a real DJ controller, and it was almost like, you know, Romez showed you the Neo I Know Kung Fu. It was almost like that moment. It's like, wow, I now know how to use this DJ controller. And using virtual reality in this way is gonna be an incredible, useful way of giving access to equipment that otherwise would be very difficult to access. I don't have access to thousands of dollars worth of DJ equipment in my house, but in virtual reality, because it's software, I now do. My favorite example of this is a company in Copenhagen, in Denmark, it's called Labster. And what they're building is a virtual science lab where any kinds of equipment that you might get in a real science lab you can have in virtual reality. So inside the environment you have gene sequencing machines, electron microscopes, pipettes, you can conduct real biology experiments, the mathematics that underpin the chemistry are incredibly complex, you can do a fermentation simulation for example that results in billions of outcomes, you can do really sophisticated uh, science. So what this means, if you're a kid living in a rural part of the world, now, with a $200 headset, you can now access the same kinds of equipment that a well-funded researcher at, say, you know, Harvard University would only have access to. That's a really big deal. Now, when it comes to augmented reality, what this allows us to do is, because we're still connected into the real world, we'll essentially be able to eliminate the need for things like user manuals or training guides. So this is the company uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, JointPad. They're, they're based here in Milan, and, and one example the, the CEO pointed me to, which is a, a large uh, trend we're seeing in the space, is if you're an expert in the world today or a technician, you largely need to go out into the world and use your skills to actually conduct repairs, do maintenance, but very soon, you'll be able to manage a control room and send an army of people out into the world and be able to guide them using heads up or you know, tablet based information and show them exactly how it is that they can do this, this, the task that they need to do. So, so JoinPad, again, based here in Milan. And a, a really helpful way to see visually how effective this is, this is a, uh, an engineer at GE wiring a wind turbine control box. On the left, you see the traditional method of using a user manual. This is how you know, most people rely on information to do their, their task. On the right, he's got a pair of augmented reality glasses, and this enables him to, to see what to do in real time as this is unfolding. And as you see, 34% more efficient in this process. Okay, switch gears for a moment. How many of you in the room have been to Amsterdam? Okay, so a fair amount. So, for those that have been, you might recognize this. This is uh, the Blue Tea House. This is in Bumble Park. It's a, it's a coffee house uh, in, in Amsterdam. This is a photo I took a few years ago when I was with my girlfriend one summer. The next summer, we went back to the same coffee house, but something had changed. We actually couldn't find a seat at this, at this coffee house. And usually when I'm with a, a smaller audience, I like to, to ask you know, people, what, what do you think happened? And I sometimes hear suggestions like, oh, they might have gotten better Wi-Fi or, oh, they may have gotten uh, you know, good reviews on TripAdvisor. Uh, you know, one time someone said, oh, they must have gotten a new muffin recipe. You know, 
very specific answer. Some of you may have got guessed this, but the real answer, what caused this addition of new people and customers, is Pokemon Go. How many of you play Pokemon Go? Okay, how, how many of you play with your kids? Okay, we're willing maybe more to admit that. So Pokemon Go is a very specific and interesting type of augmented reality, which is what we'll call location-based augmented reality. So if you're not familiar, the way Pokemon Go works is out in the world are Pokemon characters that you have to physically navigate the real world to go and, and capture. Now, the reason this technology is a big deal, I think is demonstrated in this video, and why, as business leaders, you should care about this technology. It's not a, you know, it's a game, it's, it, you know, why are we talking about a game? This, this will demonstrate. So, this was a video taken in Central Park the weekend that Pokemon Go came out. The reason was that a Vaporeon, which is a very rare kind of Pokemon, had spawned in Central Park. So because of that, take a look at, at what happened. Look at this. There's a Vaporeon that's spawned right there. So everyone's running. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one there. You tell me you're running. There's a Vaporeon. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Oh my god. This is what a Vaporeon looks like. <laughs> oh my god. So think about this for a moment. You now have a technology that changes where people go, why they go there what they do when they get there, all without changing a single thing about the physical world. Like, Kanye West didn't set up a lemonade stand in Central Park and, you know, cause this exodus of people. Like, nothing in the real world changed. This is all done by software and, di you know, a digital object that doesn't even exist in the real world. Now, if you're a business owner, this should concern you about thinking about decisions around how we navigate and, and manage the real world around us. So if you're the blue tea house in, in Bumble Park, this is actually what the blue tea house looks like in the game. So you actually, your, your business sits right between three Pokestops so people can come sip coffee and they can lazily play the game without having to, to navigate around the real world around them. And not only could you not get a seat at the blue tea house, you couldn't even find a spot on the lawn in front of the business. Kids were showing up at 10 a.m. before it opened, were staying till you know, one in the morning long after it closed. This is changing how we're relating to physical space in really interesting and significant ways. In one example, I know of someone in San Francisco who was choosing between renting two apartments in the city. One of the apartments was on a, a Pokestop, and so that was the apartment they decided to rent. So, you know, people are making real estate decisions based on this as well. One, one last example about this. So, uh, so in Pokemon Go, and I, I, the point I want to make is that, again, our relationship to physical space is being changed. So in Pokemon, this is a, a Tropius. This is one of the Pokemon that you can catch. What makes a Tropius interesting or significant is that in Pokemon Go, there are certain region-specific Pokemon that you can only find in certain parts of the world. So here in Europe, for example, it's uh, Mr. Mime. So if you want, that's, you know, it's kind of a big deal. I get to bring one home. Uh, so a few months ago, I was actually with Pascal, who you just heard from. So Pascal and I were invited to go to an event in South Africa. So I should mention that my girlfriend and I play a lot of Pokemon Go. This is like one of our favorite couples activities. This is, you know, date night. This is our, this is our version. So I told my girlfriend, I said, hey, I'm get, guess what? I get to go to Africa. I'm going to South Africa in a few weeks. And she says, oh, that's great. That sounds awesome. Uh, by the way, you definitely need to sign into my account and catch me a Tropius. Don't bother coming home unless you catch me a Tropius. Okay, great. So this is the, the job I have before me. So I get, to, I get to Africa and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, they're rare, I mean, maybe I'll find her one. I kept my phone open next to me in the hotel the first day, I think I had one day free to do some work. And actually, all of a sudden, there was, there was a Tropius, I saw one on the, on the map, it was about, I looked on Google Maps, it was at a, a 10 minute walk. So I get excited, I put all my stuff away, I get my bag, I go out to the world, I you know, ask for directions a few times, and finally, I arrive at where the Tropius is, except there was an issue. It was in a restricted area, guarded by a security guard. So this is France. So France is a security guard. I had to convince France, first I had to explain what Pokemon Go was, then I had to explain why I needed France to let me into this restricted area. 
And in case you were curious or wanted to know, uh, I was able to get into the space. I caught the Tropius. Uh, my relationship is saved. We're fine. But again, it demonstrates this weird world. And I found out what's interesting is that this was only a secure area just for that weekend. The real world is a messy place. It's constantly changing. And, and, and the way we build these experiences will have to adapt. And the way we relate to these spaces is being modified and changed by these systems. And it's not just going to be games like Pokemon Go that does this. OK, so this final piece, this is a short section. So in virtual reality, one of the most powerful experiences that I've consistently had has been spending time with other people online in virtual reality. So one of the environments that I've been covering as a, as a writer for a few years is a platform called Altspace. They were actually recently acquired by Microsoft. What Altspace has been building for a few years is ways to connect people that live all over the world to share activities in virtual reality. So in Altspace, I've gone to comedy shows, podcast tapings, uh, I went to film festivals, I've been to Coachella, the music festival in Altspace. I'll show you what it looks like. So this is how I went to the presidential debate. This was actually when Altspace was you know, first being developed. Uh, so every avatar that you see on the screen represents a person who's at home in their bedroom with a, a virtual reality headset. You can talk to them. The audio is spatially located. I met people from the Netherlands, Italy, South America, Australia, Israel, all over the world. And we were all here in this shared physical space together. And that was really kind of a, a mind-blowing experience. Now, this is actually not a new concept. How many in the room have ever had an account on Second Life? How many in the room have no idea what Second Life is? OK, so more. So for those that aren't familiar with Second Life, uh, Second Life, about 15 years ago, was a massive phenomenon. I'm sure some of the people that had accounts are looking around saying, thinking, you know, where were you? But 15 years ago, Second Life was huge. So, so the way Second Life works is you created an account for yourself, and with your account, you built an avatar, and with your avatar, you could explore these online virtual worlds. Now, what was unique 15 years ago is that unlike other big experiences, these worlds weren't built by Second Life, they were built by the other users themselves. So it was the very first, or one of the first examples of, of user-generated content. Uh, it was so big that you know, people were building nightclubs, libraries, coffee shops. Millions of people were signing up for it. It was so popular that IBM had an office space there. American Apparel had a store you could actually buy clothing. Uh, Reuters actually stationed a full-time bureau chief, so a journalist whose full-time job was to live inside and report on the activities in Second Life. Again, millions of people were signing up for this. Maybe the most interesting aspect of Second Life is the idea that a very real economy exists there. It became a, a very real uh, place to conduct a new business. So just one example. This was a user who built, in Second Life, an entire replica of Berlin from the 1920s. And the way she made a living was she would rent apartments to users in Second Life, and she would you know, make a full-time living, basically renting out apartments to people that wanted to live inside uh, Berlin. Now, what really kick-started this entire phenomenon around Second Life was this cover story from Bloomberg's Business Week. So it came out in 2006 and told the story of Anxin Shang. She was a, a user based in China. She became the world's first millionaire, buying, selling, and developing virtual real estate. She had a, you know, a beachfront property in Second Life that she would rent for $80 a week. She became a millionaire selling virtual land. This was a really big deal. Now, one of the most common questions that I hear when I have you know, conversations is people, especially those that had accounts on Second Life, say, you know, whatever happened to Second Life? You know, it was talked about as being this really big deal. You know, whatever happened? What I learned in this past year in an article I wrote is that not only does Second Life still exist, but the economy that exists in Second Life is massive. There's still almost about uh, 800,000 monthly active users, so it's still a huge uh, ecosystem. The in-game economy of Second Life last year, so these are all of the transactions between users buying and selling virtual goods and services, was half a billion dollars. The GDP of Second Life today is bigger than some countries. So I mentioned earlier this film, which is based and adapted from a book called Ready Player One. It's a Steven Spielberg film. It tells the story about this online virtual world. 
Now, Second Life is maybe a really good example of a, an early prototype or an early version or edition of this, but today, we are now living in a world where entire new concepts are being developed. I don't have time to show this video, but I would recommend looking into one platform that I'm really optimistic about, really excited about, and it's called High Fidelity. It's actually built by Philip Rosedale, the creator of Second Life, so this is his next project. And it's really trying to be like what the Oasis and Ready Player One is, the space for people to, to buy and share activities online together. Now, just to conclude, you know, one of the questions that people ask is, you know, if Second Life was talked about as being such a big deal, why today? You know, why, what's, what's new about the world today? Well, think about all of the ingredients that go into creating an online virtual world. As I mentioned, it was the first example of, of user-generated content. You know, the idea that you were gonna spend time in a world not created by, one, by some big company, but by other people. Like, YouTube was around 15 years ago, but not nearly to the extent that we've become used to user-generated content today. Or, the idea that you're gonna spend time online hanging out with people digitally that you don't see in the real world. You know, social media platforms like Facebook and these network systems like Twitter didn't really exist 15 years ago. Maybe the most important concept of all of this is the in-game economy. The Apple App Store hadn't yet been invented when Second Life first came on. So think about the way the world has changed in the last 15 years. We've largely become more native to the things required to make an online virtual world usable for people. We've become adapted to these virtual worlds. And it's true that we already have virtual realities. In fact, most of us probably have them in our pockets right now. We have Instagram and Facebook and our email. These are, you know, these are our virtual lives that we, we show up to, but we look at them through a screen, right? We have this screen that, that separates from us from these worlds. But with augmented and virtual reality, what we're doing is we're eliminating the screen. We're either stepping entirely into these worlds or bringing these worlds into the real world around us. I think that's a really exciting prospect and why I'm excited about these technologies. Thank you.